Uh-huh. Wanna ask her? Yeah. Wanna uh me daka yepi wanna wasana chante washtia yok be an up each use up be uh she shook a dutta emaki up be do the makuta I'm <laughs> Yapi doctor kicha on spimich itche ga wo on spimich itcha wa kia ga dok en daya he cha mo o wa ki he he wa bdao wo on spimich wa ngatu ya yam ne adikta wa ne ga wo on spimich itcha ki api doktor kicha wo on spimich itcha wa kia ya hipi cha pinama ya yapi thank you for being here we're happy you're here uh, we also thank our colleague Rainy Cloud for helping us develop uh, this presentation, these ideas, although because of a medical situation, she's not able to be here with us today. Yeah. So, um, yes, uh, thank you for being here. And today we want to walk you through some practical steps that we have taken to design and redesign our Dakota language programs in a way that combines the best findings of research into effective language instruction. And our traditional Dakota teaching styles that were effective for our people before we entered into the colonial school system, which has been destructive to our people in so many different ways. We'll be using the word pedagogy today. And that word is important because it means the way we teach the science of teaching, but it's just not a science in the colonial way of using that word. Dakota teaching ways are also a science. They come from many generations of experience and testing and observation. Much of what gets published as scientific research into effective teaching methods is just Washichu people discovering what we have known for millennia and then proving that it works and taking credit for the idea. But even within the colonial framework, much of what research shows that language teachers should do is not what they actually do. And that's why so many people are disappointed about how fluent they are after taking a few language courses. So what we are going to show you today is how to design a program that really actually works and gets your learners to be more fluent in the language faster, but also carries out our culture. And of course, you can adapt this to your own culture and communities. 
as you find it appropriate to do so. So there are two types of research that we are joining together today, and then we're going to talk more specifically about Dakota ways of teaching and learning. But right now we're just talking very generally about something that has become very trendy and very important across education, which is the idea of decolonizing education. That means moving away from the colonial European ways of teaching and learning that we have known are bad for the minds of our children and as and also for their hearts. And decolonial pedagogy is the alternative to that. It's not specific to any language or any specific culture. So each community makes their own version of decolonial pedagogy. But these are the general principles. In decolonial pedagogy, we stop treating the teacher like they're a boss or a master. And instead they become a helper, a consultant a guide. The learner is not viewed as somebody who is ignorant or stupid and we have to teach them everything, but rather they're viewed as somebody who already knows a lot from all the time that they have been alive and they have developed questions. So the teachers are there to help them get answers to their questions, but not to ignore all of what they already know. In the case of a language, maybe they don't know even one word of the language, but they do know a lot of other things, like they know at least one other language. They know their community, their town, their household, their family. So they can use all that expertise to start learning new language for that. So education isn't about just deciding what they should learn, writing it in a textbook, and then making them learn it. It's about helping them seek out what they want to know when they want to know it. In other words, it's a relationship not just like a factory where you're pumping out products who know a certain set of things, that's more the colonial model, but rather a relationship between learners and teachers where learners are the drivers. They seek and we as teachers facilitate. And the purpose of education is also different in this case. It's not just about passing a test or making more money. Rather, the purpose of education becomes about healing the community, building a better life and a better world, undoing injustices and expressing people's core identities in a, a fuller way. Evidence-based language teaching is, is talking about what all the research into what works and doesn't has found. And it's found some really key things about language teaching that align with indigenous knowledge. So first, we have found that language is, uh, is best learned when it's taught and practiced in real contexts that are important to learners. So they're learning the language in a, in a context or a situation that they already care about. They're not being asked to try something completely new. They're already curious. Also that their curiosity should drive what we learn about. And so that when they acquire new language, it's because they need it for a reason. So they're always needing something new that we then provide for them. Research also shows us that language is best learned when it's practiced in authentic relationships so that Learning the language is helping them to belong. It's empowering them, making them more capable. So having real relationships with other speakers or other learners is a huge motivator in, in learning and retaining the language. Research also shows us that variation exists within every language, meaning dialects, accents, slang, idioms, regional differences, those exist in every language. And that that's a good thing. It shows that the language is alive, living, being changed, being adapted. And that's not something to fight or to repress. It's something to recognize and honor and actually teach the learners about all those differences. As well as when people are becoming multilingual, that's a change in their identity and it has, it builds in new strengths for them. So we do not do them any favors by telling them exactly how they should be bilingual or how they should use their languages. Rather, they benefit from us embracing their own special way of being multilingual and giving them more freedom to be creative with their multiple languages. Watch today. All right, so before we get into the specifics of what we're talking about, we want to uh, have you spend some time thinking about 
these big ideas we just shared. We're going to ask that you hold your questions and comments to the end and just brainstorm ideas in each of the four breaks we're going to take uh, through this session so we can stay on our time schedule. So to start, open your browser and type in the link we have provided here in the bottom left window and it's also in the chat window. And you'll find a worksheet that we have made for you to keep track of your ideas. Open it and then make a copy. Uh, and then that copy is just for you. You can do whatever you want with it. If you have a colleague who is here today, share the copy with them so they can write on it too or type on it. And you can see each other's writing. This is just a scratched paper for thinking. And later you can have more conversations. But for now, just make a copy of the document and share it with a colleague if you want and take notes on it with your thoughts. And the question to reflect on is, how does the decolonial and evidence-based type of teaching that we just described in the previous slide differ from what you're currently doing? Take uh, about four minutes here and you're developing a vision for a new type of language program going forward. And if you don't have a language program yet, this is the start of that. Uh, and we will go on mute for four minutes to let you think and make notes. Okay, so make sure you get that link and get the document and we'll be back in four minutes.
All right. Thank you uh, for taking the time to start your reflections and collaborations. We're going to stop three more times during this workshop to give you a chance to start getting uh, more ideas. And then you can continue after we are done. We're also going to give you our emails in case you want to talk more after the workshop. And also we're gonna give you more resources you can click on to keep learning about this type of teaching. So it's going kind of fast, but you'll have the tools to keep working after the workshop is done. Before we give you more time to work on the design uh, of the worksheet, let us explain how we have found that evidence-based practices and uh, traditional Dakota practices go together. And uh, our traditional Dakota ways of teaching and learning, the relationship between a teacher and a student happens because the student needs to get something done. Usually something to help with survival or to improve the community. A lot of what young people need to learn is how to be a good relative. And that requires lessons and mentors. So that has always been learned through relationships that are built between less experienced people and more experienced people. And then the teacher or elder or more experienced person doesn't give the learner a multiple choice exam to show whether they are getting better at doing something. No, they watch the person do it and give them feedback about what is going well and what can still be improved. So this way of building relationships has always existed for our Dakota people and help people learn any skill they needed to become a good relative. Similarly, we know that the most effective language courses don't uh, rely on textbooks or start with just teaching grammar. They don't use a bunch of word lists where the learners are just memorizing the words out of context. No, the most effective courses start with a task that the learner wants to accomplish in the language, and then they work backwards from there, making sure that the learner is gonna be prepared to complete that task when it's time. This is sometimes known as task-based learning or project-based learning or communicative language teaching, all names for this way of thinking about learning, where we take a real world interaction or task that they're going to be able to do and we work backwards to prepare them to do it. We judge the competency uh, um, of someone to complete that task. We call that communicative competency in the research by how much they are able to communicate in a context appropriate way, meaning they know how to be respectful or funny or formal or casual. Um, in the right context. So they use the right phrases at the right times to fit with both the language and the culture. That's communicative competency. And that's the most important language skill, more important than being exact with your grammar or pronouncing everything perfectly. And of course, we talk about performance assessments. So measuring growth through actually performing those communicative interactions. So this is uh, all research that supports the Dakota way of approaching language and uh, learning. So designing a whole program or a whole course obviously takes a long time. Um, but I have an example right here. Thank you, Jennifer, for asking. We have an example right here that I took from Washichiyapi from English, but you should think of one in the language that you're teaching. So we're just going to spend four minutes and just pick a pick a task or an interaction that you can imagine is important for a, a learner group. We say, I say a group of learners. It could be one learner, but when you think about a group of learners, you might be using you know, this kind of colonial system of having levels like the beginners, the intermediates, the advanced. We also have to use that system in some of our programs, but you might think about ways of grouping your learners that make more sense for your culture. So we've been talking about what we call affinity grouping, meaning grouping our learners by the role that they play in society so that they can learn how to fulfill that role in the language. An example would be like grandmas or children or teenagers or fathers. Those could be groups of people where we know what kind of real life tasks and interactions they're typically gonna wanna do. 
So we can prepare a course that helps them do that in a language. And so, so think of a group like that, either a level or a grade level or an age or an affinity group. And then think about one task or interaction that that group wants to be able to complete in the language, one scenario. And kind of script it out. What does that interaction sound like when speakers are doing it? So I gave you a, an example here in our Minnesota in English, what happens when you give a gift to someone? And I scripted out a typical interaction with lots of culture inside of it. So script out something like that. And that what is gonna give you what you wanna teach in this little unit. And we're gonna break it down further into how to teach it afterwards. So take four minutes and use your, your worksheet to develop something like this for your language. We'll go on mute for four more minutes. Uh-huh. So hopefully you came up with an interesting idea during that time. And of course.
course, you'll have uh, time to develop it more. So now that you know what you want to teach, I have a good idea about it. Let's talk about how you want to teach it. In our Dakota ways, a lot of teaching is done through the telling of stories. And there's a very specific way that stories are told and listened to in our traditional ways. Language learners should learn to listen to and tell stories in the right ways. But we can also pick stories that use the language that they are currently learning and that help them to learn how to complete their goal interaction. But that's not the only way. We can also sing songs and teach those songs to young people. We have traditional games. But nowadays it's possible and fun to teach the language through games from our culture uh, and other cultures too, uh, like Monopoly or Uno. Uh, when you play those in Dakota, that can help them learn and practice really useful languages. Uh, and they can also work on mini projects or huge projects that can either help prepare them for the goal interaction or a big project in which they use this interaction as well as others and that they're building up to that activity over time. Of course, practicing talking to relatives and building relationships is also an important activity and interactions for specific purposes uh, to buy something or to uh, barter with somebody. For example, these have all been traditional opportunities for learning. And actually all these traditional activities are also perfect ways to make sure that language is picked up and stick because research into how languages are learned has shown us that the important ingredient in getting a language learned, whether you're talking about a baby or a child or an adult, are what we call the three Fs. Those are form, function, and frequency. So I'll explain what each of those is, and you'll see how the activities that Shishoka did just listed are really good vehicles for exposing learners to the three Fs so that their fluency in the language is increasing as quickly as possible. So form is really about the, the sound and the pronunciation. So it's really important that just like when we were babies that we, we learn through hearing first and watching people make the sounds and that we practice making the sounds so that we grasp the, the form to the ear. Um, it's important to note that if, you're, if your learners can already read and write in another language, and you use writing to teach them how to say the words, they're usually gonna mispronounce it because they're gonna use the writing system that they already know from the other language. And that's how you get those real strong accents and those mispronunciations. So it's important to hold off on writing until they're producing speech and use it so that they are describing what they would say out loud, which is what writing is for. Um, but they practice really getting the form down, both grasping it when they hear it and also making it in their own mouth and their own muscle. Function is talking about what the word or the phrase means, but it doesn't mean looking it up in a dictionary or saying this word means that in English. Function means when do I say this? What does it do? What happens when I say this? So it's really important that we teach whole phrases and that we teach them in context and not just isolated words that we just repeat, but actually what situation do I say this in? because that is how our brain actually stores the memory, is that when I'm in this situation, I use this phrase. Even if I don't understand why each word is in that phrase or why the grammar is that way, we store things by context, by situation. So we wanna make sure they're embedded there. That, that's what it is to understand the function, which means that we have to recreate those scenarios in the classroom in order for that function to be experienced and to stick. Um, so there's a lot of theater and a lot of help that goes into that. and then. All language teachers know about frequency, <laughs> repetition, 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 repetition. You know that research shows maybe they need to hear it as little as 40 times, but they probably need to hear it closer to 200 times before it really sticks. Nobody likes repetition if it's just literally repeating or if I just do flashcards all day. Repetition is best done when it's in various different contexts, various different speakers. I say it, you say it, my friend says it. And it's in different forms. It's a little bit different each time. So those stories, those songs, those games 
they are fun ways to get the same language over and over and over again. I'm not doing the same thing over and over again, but I'm getting those same bits of language because it's been planned that way by my genius teacher to make sure that I'm going to get those same chunks of language, however many hundreds of times I'm going to need them. All right, uh, the repetition, that's really key to me. Uh, so let's take another four minutes here, though, and look at your scratch paper again. Look at the script that you've written so far and the words and the phrases inside it and start brainstorming ways to teach those phrases with the three Fs that we just mentioned previously. And so that the learners will then be ready to combine all of them and successfully complete the goal, task, or interaction. So brainstorm some activities, either from your own indigenous culture or even from the mainstream culture, uh, like Akapo or Itsy Bitsy Spider, uh, or you can mix and match. Use whatever you can think of and brainstorm the ones that would be helpful for teaching this collection of language. Think about the phrases that make up the bigger interaction and how students could get to practice uh, their three Fs with all of those. Uh, so we're gonna give you four minutes here and we'll go on mute.
Great question. So the activities that you uh, just brainstorm are what you can do during the lessons that lead up to the actual performing of the goal task or the interaction. That way, each lesson is fun and gets them a little closer to being ready for the ultimate interaction that they are learning to carry out. But of course, each activity and each lesson can be challenging, especially if students are anxious or if they are not very advanced in the language. The ultimate goal is to teach with around 90% immersion, meaning to speak in the language all the time and not translate. This is the most effective way to teach a language, and it's how our ancestors learned new languages when they encountered other people. So let's think about how our ancestors learned new languages. If they didn't have dictionaries or Google Translate, well, they heard the words being used in a context when people were doing actions. So they knew that the action goes with this phrase. Sometimes they could point at things and someone would show them this and then the person would say the name out loud and they would repeat it over and over to practice it as they would get better. They would use what language they did know to describe things they didn't know the name of. And the speakers of the other language would help them out by supplying the words and phrases that they knew they were reaching for. They needed to know things like, what is that called? And you know what I mean? Pretty early on, so they could work through these roadblocks. And going back to frequency, they didn't remember the words because they got frequency from studying flashcards or doing language drills. Nope. They repeated new phrases to themselves over and over until it stuck in their mouth muscles and their mind. That's the phrase that you say in that situation. And of course, they would uh, practice out these phrases by trying them out in different interactions. The more interactions they had when they, uh, where they had used the phrase, the easier it was to remember these phrases. And so research shows us that this is where the real work of the teacher comes in, is to do two types of work. One is called scaffolding and one is called sequencing or sequencing for the zone of proximal development, if, you, if you've read about that term. Um, so when we scaffold, we help them get it. We make it easier to grasp um, or easier to perform. And so we create visuals of objects, people, situations, actions that provide that context so that when we're teaching a phrase, the function of the phrase is clear. There's not a need for us to translate it word for word because they get it, they connect it to that context. We can also create those same visuals or videos, multimedia tools um, without the language. And then the student can have that as their practice opportunity that they put the language on there as their review. Um, another way of scaffolding is to create a sort of a guide or sort of something to lean on if they forget or if it becomes a lot to remember. Many of the languages have very long words and so you may have folks who get halfway through a word and forget how it ends. So you can create visuals either in, the, in a physical classroom up on the wall or in their hand or like Google Docs like we just shared with you, something that they have in front of them that helps them lean on that and get back into the interaction without having to ask for help or having to ask for translation so that they're more able to, to get through. That's what scaffolding means. Sequencing means you're thinking about what they can learn next, what they're close to understanding and what you can add on without too much difficulty. That's their zone of proximal development. So you take the phrases that they know and you make a situation where they're gonna need to add just a couple to do a new activity. So it's a little more complex each time, but they're not completely lost either. It's building on what they already know and are ready to learn and add. So as a teacher, you want the students to drive what they're learning to do. And then you 
draw on your traditional culture and the culture that the students are living in um, to get ideas for how they can learn this without needing a lot of translation or to do a bunch of drills. Your most important role is probably that you use your expertise to put things in an order so that they learn the simpler things before they learn the more complicated things. And there's always something there to help them understand when the function of the phrase isn't clear or to remind them if they forgot what we did yesterday. Because this is how you build that confidence and that willingness to take risks and try because you're making it very doable and you're making it feel safe. Um, so we call this sequencing and scaffolding. They're the last two stages of the process of backward design. So it means you started with the ultimate goal. You identify what they needed to learn and now you're putting it into order and thinking about how they're gonna learn it and what help they're going to need. You know that they need form, function, and frequency. So you're designing how they're gonna get that so that they're ready to do the interaction at the end of this little unit. So right now we'll give you four minutes, um, maybe three minutes. Um, we'll uh, take your scratch paper and take those activities and those ideas that you've come up with and put them into an order that makes sense. Starting from the simple, moving to the complex, and then think about what kind of help you might wanna create for them. What kind of tools will help them to keep going even if it's maybe a lot to remember or there's certain things about it that are hard. So take three minutes and just try to design the order of these. All right. Thank you so much for participating today. We hope this has sparked a lot of ideals for you that you will continue developing. On the slide here, we have our emails in case you want to contact us. And also links to tools that continue uh, that you can use to continue help designing effective courses in an effective language program that is empowering and keeps your culture alive. Uh, we now have, I think about what, uh, three to five minutes left here? One fifteen is when we're done, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so yeah. we kind of have like about five minutes here left for any questions that you may have. Uh, so 
Uh, somebody asked about uh, flashcards, so we'll answer that question first. Anka, you want to? I have very strong opinions about flashcards. If uh, if you want to uh, hear those, but I would definitely want to hear Shishokajita's thoughts as well. Um, <laughs> okay, so sure. I you want me to go first, or you? Oh, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, um, I think flashcards. Uh, picture flashcards is what I like to use. So I'll take pictures and uh, you can do like a eight by 11 picture and then you can uh, do all kinds of different games with them and make it fun. And uh, that's how I use flashcards. Uh, I don't like to use flashcards with words on them as we already stated earlier. Uh, you know, let's keep the, the written form out until, you know, the very end. And that's that's my opinion on flashcards. Yes, super agree. So here's how I design flashcards. I used to have an app that I loved and I recommend it to everyone and they discontinued it. So now I make them in PowerPoint or Google Slides. Um, you can make them in Canva or you can make them in PowerPoint, whatever, and you can put them into Google Slides because Google Slides allows you to randomize. So here's the attributes that I like to see. Back to form function frequency form, like Shishoku just said, they need to hear it. There needs to be a sound component, preferably, especially for beginners, uh, early learners, um, only a sound component. So I like that they can click. If you make them in, in PowerPoint, you can insert audio and they can just click on the audio and they can hear it. And then like he said, the function is the, is the visual that you put there. I prefer to get really rich visuals, like really, like it's clear what it is, but it's really realistic. And canva.edu is a wonderful tool for that. I encourage you all to, yes, Heather mentioned it, to sign up. You just have to state that you're a teacher and they'll approve you for a free account and you can use tons of images for free. And that saved me so many hours of Google imaging things. Um, and you can make really beautiful slides in there and all kinds of, all kinds of things. Um, if any of you know Alex Firethunder, he's doing amazing things with Canva. So, um, giving the function with the clear visual, giving the form with audio so that they try it and then they hear the audio and then they try it again. And then the frequency through, um, if they're doing it alone, uh, randomization. Um, no, it's a different person, I think, different Alex. <laughs> uh, randomization, but I like what Shokuduta said too, which is that if you can use them in the classroom and have them be more fun um, and have them actually have something to do with the interaction, that's great. I use. The same cards that I use for, um, I use a modified Uno, modified Go Fish, um, and card games are also the, the flashcards when possible. Yeah, very good. Um, next, uh, somebody said, how long is the critical immersion stage? Your recommendations on how to transition to instill courage to practice applying it outside the context of learning space. Michelle, there's two ways that people use that term critical emergency. So can you tell me which one you're using it? Do you mean the age of the learner or do you mean the time that the learner of whatever age been in immersion? I've heard it used. Um, hi, I was thinking critical immersion stage because a lot of people are wondering how do they do the additive English, right? To the local language. So what is that critical stage where they need to be absolutely 90% or more in the, on the target language? It's a really good question. I'm glad you asked this. Um, so I'll give you sort of two answers. Shokuduta might disagree with me. I have two answers. One is that there's been a lot of, in the old days, there was a lot of talk about, they call uh, critical age periods, which means the age of the learning. And there's a lot of talk about they have to be exposed X amount before they're six or before they're 12. That has been completely debunked. That's not true. Learners of any age, both Shishokuduta and I are adult learners of languages. So there is no age. What it is is the situation. You have to have a lot of time and you have to be willing to try things and make a goof of yourself. Um, and you have to have the good teachers and good input. Little kids have that really easily. Uh, Beth Brown is providing a lot of <laughs> right? great teaching, lots of time around the language. And us adults, we struggle to get that. But it's not because our brains can't learn. In terms of how much immersion I do personally when I'm teaching languages, 
I, I do more total, total, total immersion in the early stages because I really want the learner to get used to it and to be willing to struggle. And uh, it's nice to kind of create the illusion that, that they have to communicate in this language. There's no other way. It's not true, but it's nice if they feel like they really have to try and they don't just drop into all these things. Oh, you know what I mean? That one word that you said before, you know, <laughs> you mm -hmm. really want them to try, right? Um, and then I use more translation and also more um, English to talk about culture with the more advanced because they, yeah. they know how to hold the conversation. Yeah, well, uh, I agree with Aka. Anybody at any age can learn the language and it's just the amount of time you spend uh, in the language. But also too, if we have to think adults, uh, they can pick up more complex grammatical patterns faster than children, which takes the children longer to learn some of those more advanced things. So I think uh, it depends on the age group. Uh, so we can like, as adults, uh, we can teach uh, like more complex interactions and they can kind of understand them more quickly. And then uh, for the kids, that's a little bit more difficult. So they kind of have to do a lot more scaffolding, you know, out with that, out with those, uh, those complex thoughts. I see we're, we're done. So I'll say thank you to everyone. Pidamaya. Pidamaya.